I have one other really specific question and it's, um, I don't know if this is just like, because you know, we were talking about misconceptions and unlearning. Like, I don't, this is one of those like things that we've picked up that I don't know if it's a misconception or real or not, but there being, um, mucus in the nose or eyes when the baby's born that you have to clear out like what what is the thing that needs to happen there is that because again like i'll hear these things and like i get the medical system version of them which includes the like oh what you need to do about that and i'm like okay maybe you're giving me the full story but maybe you're not and so i'm i'm asking you to hopefully give me the actual full story <laughs> Well, I could certainly give you give you my my opinion on that, Brendan. Yes, sure. um, yeah, I think that is this is one of the 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 big areas that uh, where 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 my perspective differs from from the medical system. So I, you know, I I, I don't know if I mentioned before, but um, you know, one of the standard procedures in the hospital is to um, is to you know routinely. Uh, assault, I would say, uh, a newborn baby immediately after birth with a bulb syringe. So that's a small sort of rubber, rubbery instrument, plastic instrument with a bulb on one end and a point on the other. And, and the, the, the ostensible purpose of this is to clear mucus from the baby's mouth and nose. And so uh, at the moment of birth, often, most often, a newborn baby's first experience is to have this long um, implement shoved up both nostrils uh, quite quite quickly and and, uh, and 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 violently, I would say, and then also put down down their throats uh, also. And um, I uh, I think this is not only unnecessary but but very painful and very traumatizing. And again, this is a child's very first experience of life on Earth, um, and this happens, you know, within moments of their emergence. Um, and I think, as a society, we've been so kind of inured to this this kind of torture, you know, often thanks to our own trauma, thanks to the sort of again monotonous mind control of the media and sort of doctor as hero savior indoctrination that we see this not only as normal but as beneficial. And I think it's very, very misplaced. I don't think it's necessary at all. And when you think about it, the, the process of moving through the birth canal and of emerging from the mother's vagina actually compresses the baby's head and empties the nose of you know, most of the, any sort of deleterious amount of, of mucus. And so um, that process has already happened as the baby has emerged from their mother's body. So that it's actually a very natural kind of clearing of the mucosal pa passages as the baby emerges. But it's still very normal for a baby to come into the world a little bit snuffly and kind of gurgly. And, and, and this is, again, well within the realm of normal. And my perspective on the transition that a baby moves through to calibrate to the outside world and to take their first breath is, is probably quite different from how um, you know, a physician would, would see it. So there's a, there's a really important distinction between a baby that isn't breathing yet and a baby that is healthy and alive and still receiving oxygen from the umbilical cord. So again, I have seen, I would say that, that most babies that I've witnessed being born don't emerge immediately screaming and breathing. Most babies actually require a period, a few seconds, even a minute or two of space in order to figure out where the heck they are and to become embodied. And there's so much fear around that transition and there's so much terror when a baby is born uh, with a bluish color or not breathing and screaming right away. And I think that fear is, again, really misplaced. So, um, you know, I see a lot of blue babies and 
that, to my mind, is a baby that is is fully oxygenated. It's not um, it's not outside of the realm of normal for a baby to have blue coloring, even for a baby to be born without good color, to be born floppy. Um, I think because we live in this world where that is seen as um, very dangerous, we don't really have any context for it. Like that, that, that is not really allowed in this culture, and yet I've seen it many, many times. And so I think even in home births often, um, midwives are, in my view, far too quick to exert some kind of, um, to, to, to fix and, and to kind of hero the situation when I think more often than not, most babies um, would actually be better served by being allowed some space to, to come to of their own volition. So, you know, in fact, one of the, the babies that I have witnessed being born that um, <laughs> you know, had the sort of so-called lowest APGAR score that seemed the most compromised was my own youngest child. And actually, he was born completely white and completely limp and quite lifeless. And it was a very interesting experience for me because I actually, I actually kind of blacked out for a few minutes, or a few moments anyway, a minute or two. And my husband very gently tapped me on the shoulder and had to say, yo, wake up, you know, get, get your baby. Because I had birthed him on my back, and so he'd kind of like come out onto the bed, and I was like, it was a very difficult birth, long story, and I won't go into all that, but, um, but I remember sort of hearing my husband's voice and thinking, oh, oh right, there's a baby. And I sat up, and I looked between my legs, and there was this white, 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 white baby that really didn't seem alive at all. And I picked him up, and I brought him to my chest. And I always birth naked because I think it's very important, actually, um, for my baby's very first experience of his or her mother to be my skin and not, you know, a nylon sports bra. And also, in terms of just um, the safety factor, um, one of the things that will trigger a baby's urge to become alive is the exchange of pheromones and hormones that they smell on their mother's skin. Um, and for me as well, being naked is very protective because I want to be absorbing all of my baby's smells and chemicals so that my body receives the correct uh, triggers to stop bleeding and to and to calibrate appropriately as well. And so I think actually uh, being naked is, is, is protective for both mother and baby. So anyway, I brought my baby up to my chest and there were another few moments of, of kind of waiting. And then my baby became alive. And I think it was such an interesting experience and I think very few babies are given that space to kind of uh, come into their bodies in a very spontaneous way. And what I've come to know too is that in the absence of any kind of underlying physical problem, most babies are not only equipped to survive the birth process, but to really thrive. It's actually a process that, that is is healthy, is life-giving, the birth process itself. And again, that's not really a perspective that, that, that we hold as a culture. There's this sort of sense of like, oh, you know, at, at any moment, you know, something could, could go wrong. And, and, th and that's not to say that that doesn't ever happen. I don't want to downplay those situations where, you know, things do sometimes go wrong. But again, that's the same in every situation in life, right? So anyway, I'll get to the point here, Brendan, but uh, I think 
In my experience, I have never, ever, ever once used a bulb syringe. I don't think it's necessary. In fact, I think it's counterproductive. And what it can do, when you think about it, too, just in a practical way, this pointy thing being shoved into the baby's nose and mouth, that can actually push mucus farther down into the baby's body. It can also create a, a vasovagal response, like a trauma response. It can be really very painful and traumatizing and I just don't think it's necessary because birth works so beautifully well and so in the cases of my own babies and and babies that I've witnessed being born if they do have a lot of mucus that remains you can take your hand the mother can take her hand and just clear the mucus away right like like the way that we do when we blow our nose that's all that's all right. that, that generally needs to happen sometimes mothers like to use their own mouths, and that's an option too. It's never really been something that has been intuitive for me. I've always found that just using my hand and kind of clearing any kind of snot or, or, or mucus away from baby's mouth and nose is practical and easy, and, and there's never been an issue with that. So yeah, it's another one of those things that I think we really overcomplicate with by, by doing, by doing far more than needs to be done in most cases. Thank you for listening to The Brendan Murata Show. If you liked this episode, please share it with someone else who would also like it, and then go on whatever platform you listen to the show on and leave a positive review. If you want to support the show directly, go to brendanmurata.com slash show and subscribe there. Paid subscribers get special unreleased bonus material and live events that are only available to them. Once again, that is brendanmurata.com slash show. Thank you for listening, and I will talk to you all later.